Hi everybody, Dr. Dice here again. As part of our Learn to Play video series, we're going to be teaching you how to play Moonstone. Moonstone is a game for one to four players. It is a skirmish game on a small scale, so you won't need more than six figures to play it, but the figure range is so beautiful, you're gonna find yourself wanting to have a whole lot more than that in your collection. Let's take a look. The book, the cards, and the retail boxes all show what symbols the figures inside belong to. The symbols are the sun for the commonwealth, the moon for the dominion, or the stag for the cult of Le Chavalt. Some characters have two symbols, which means they will work for either faction. When building your force, simply choose a primary faction and make sure that all of the six figures you choose will work for that faction. So what's the objective of a game of Moonstone? Well, it's just what it sounds like. You're trying to pick up Moonstones. The player with the most Moonstones in their possession at the end of turn four is the victor. Most games, you'll do this. It's a simple drop of 12 inches and let the Moonstones scatter. At the beginning of every turn, there's a replenish step where we look at the number of blue dots on the bottom of each character card and give them energy up to the number of dots that they have unmarked. Characters can then use that energy during their turn in order to perform certain actions. Let's cover the actions next. In a game of Moonstone, there are four rounds. In each round, you're going to activate your characters alternating one at a time until you've expended all of their energy or done anything that they want to do. So on the right hand side here, you can see the action card. These are all of the things that you could potentially do during your activation and the abilities down at the bottom will refer to things that actually are on your individual character card. The first thing you can do is a jog. A jog is a four inch move. It costs zero energy. Now you couldn't do that move if you're engaged with an enemy. What does being engaged with an enemy look like? Let's see. In this example, Boulder is within two inches or his range of C6-2. Therefore, C6-2 would not be able to jog until he gets out of Boulder's range. To do that, he's going to have to take a step. As you can see on the card on the right, the step is a one cost action. It costs one energy and you can move one inch. So he can take steps until he gets out of boulders range and then he could make his jog in addition to that we also have another ability called traverse it allows you to jump over obstacles you have a harvest action which allows you to pull moonstones out of the ground an active ability a arcane ability and a melee ability the arcane active and melee abilities are all listed on your card and there may be some other things on your card that are passive abilities that influence what your character can do. Everything gives these characters a lot of flavor and, and color. So in this example we're about to show next, we're going to talk about harvesting moonstones. At the beginning of a game of moonstone, when the stones are dropped, they will land on one of four sides. In this case, the die has landed on a 1, which means that this Moonstone is at a depth of 1, practically on the surface. Boulder moves up so his base is touching the Moonstone and will attempt to take a Harvest action. A Harvest action reduces the depth of the Moonstone you are touching by 1. In this instance, if the Moonstone is already at 1, you pick it up off the ground. The only caveat to being able to take this action is you may not be in the engagement range of another figure. In this case, Doug the Flatulent has a melee range of three. I see that the template is out there to three inches. Boulder is safe and is able to pick up that Moonstone. 
that Moonstone will then be placed on Boulder's card, where it will remain for hopefully the rest of the game. Let's take a look at melee combat in the game with Moonstone. We've got four different attacks and two different guards. There are three cards of each. So we've got Falling Swing, Rising Attack, Thrust, Sweeping Cut, High Guard, and Low Guard. Each of these cards feature a damage type, and some feature multiple damage types, so you can pick which one you want to use. Let's look at an example of combat. In our example, Doug the Flatulent, the Goblin on the Dog, is attacking Boulder. Doug has a melee stat of four, as shown on the right. Doug will receive four cards, because that is his base melee stat, with an additional two cards for being the attacker. Boulder will receive two melee cards, as that is his melee stat. Both players look at their hand and secretly select one card that they wish to play. They will place that card face down. Then, simultaneously, they will reveal their cards. In this case, it looks like they both elected to use a thrust. The thrust deals piercing damage, and if we take a look and see how the damage will resolve, we're going to look to see what card the opponent played, and we're going to cross-reference it on the card. Both players having played a thrust makes this really easy. Both players will take three damage, both players will deal three damage. We also have another thing that we could do here. In the event that any of the characters had a second thrust in their hand, they could now play it to the table. That second thrust creates what's called a critical effect. A critical effect is going to multiply the amount of damage. So a second thrust would cause the damage to be times two. All characters have a signature move printed on the bottom of their card. If during a melee combat you use your signature move, in this case for Boulder, as shown on the right, it happens to be a thrust, Boulder could upgrade his thrust to that signature move when combat occurs. So cards are revealed and Boulder's player says, well, I think I want to upgrade my card. He plays his signature move. It now replaces the deal column on the thrust with the new deal column from the Crushing Embrace card, the signature move. If the damage type changed, that would happen as well. And in addition to that, any passive effects or end step effects as resolved on the bottom of the card also come into effect. Here we have the card of Doug the Flatulent. If he and Boulder had just gotten into it and Doug had taken two damage, we would mark two damage boxes on his card. Any energy or blue bubbles that are crossed off would not generate energy in the next turn. In this example, Doug has taken four damage, which means some of his energy boxes are covered up. Next turn, he's going to get less energy unless somebody can heal him before this turn ends. This is the arcane deck. There are three green ones, two green twos, and one green three. And that holds true for each of those colors. There are also one catastrophe for each color. In this example, Boulder's character has one energy remaining. He's too far away from the Moonstone to get to it, and even if he could, he couldn't begin to harvest it. He elects to take an arcane ability check called Stone Song, which occurs on the bottom of his card. It costs one energy and allows him to influence a Moonstone within six inches. To do this, he has to take an arcane check. You'll notice that there is a X with a colored background on his card. That means that he will take an arcane check and he will look for any number with that colored background and declare it during his arcane check. If he succeeds, he will be able to take the effect that is after that. If he lies and gets caught, then he could potentially suffer a catastrophe. Look at an example of what that means. The Boulder player draws three cards as, according to the arcane stat in the upper right hand corner, that's what he's entitled to. His three cards are a blue two, a pink one, and a green two. The Boulder player then declares face down, this is secret information, 
I have a blue two. Does the opponent believe him? Well, the opponent has what's called an arcane resist hand. That arcane resist hand is six cards. Those six cards are looked at by the resisting player. And in a two player game, it's your opponent. And in a multiplayer game, it's the player to your left. And this would be what the arcane resist hand looked like. Hmm, there's also a blue two in there. As we remember from looking at the arcane cards previously, there are only two blue twos in the entire deck. What are the odds that the boulder player got one? Well, the resisting player decides to call a bluff. I don't think you have it, he says. The boulder player reveals his card, shows that it is in fact a blue two. The effect occurs. In this case, the stone song actually reduces the depth of the moonstone by that many, uh, by X, and X in this case is two. Once the effect is completed, because there was a bluff called, initiating player was not actually bluffing, they get to perform that same action a second time for free at the same or at a different target. In this case, the boulder player has a second stone available and decides he's going to make the attempt over there. Now we know from looking at the boulder player's hand, he doesn't have any other blue cards, but the boulder player decides he's gonna to try to get away with one. He looks at his card, which in this case is a pink one, plays it to the table, and claims, I have a blue one. The resisting player now has to make a choice. Does he believe the boulder player, or will he call a bluff? If he believes him, the effect happens, the card never has to be shown, and we move on with the game. If the resisting player calls a bluff, however, and in this case, it was a bluff, the resisting player gets to play any card from their hand onto the pile, and that is the card that the boulder player will have to use. In this case, a catastrophe. If we look on boulder's card, we can see what the catastrophe effects are. In this case, the resisting player will set the depth of the target moonstone to a number of their choice. So, if I don't have any players in that area, I'll probably set it to four, make it nice and difficult for boulder to get out of the ground. Just as in the previous example, where an arcane ability check occurred against a moonstone, an arcane ability check could also occur if you were trying to perform an action that targeted one of your own team members, perhaps healing or giving them energy or some other effect. But you can also take arcane checks against your opponents. In this case, Swiggity Sweetie's card in the upper right hand corner shows that he does have an arcane ability that allows him to shoot his pistol costs one energy and it will shoot to a range of eight inches. He needs any number in green in order to make this work. He is going to take an arcane check. Arcane checks against opponents are a little bit different than those against friendlies or the environment. Arcane checks against opponents will be modified by their evade stat. If we look at boulders, he has an evade of plus two. This means that any arcane action targeting him will cause the attacker to get plus two cards. So back to Swiggerty Swooty, he has an arcane of three. He gets three cards to his base and two additional cards for the evade stat that Boulder has. We'll perform the arcane check as normal. In this example, we're going to talk about reaction steps. So there are only a couple of ways you can spend energy outside of your character's activation. One is going for it in which case you're buying an extra two cards during a melee attack. The other is a reaction step. So in this example, Swiggerty Swooty, our little goblin with the octopus on his head, has decided he wants to come after Boulder. He's advanced up and now he's getting ready to attack Boulder. But Boulder doesn't want to be attacked and he does have one energy remaining. So after Swiggerty Swooty's move has completed, Boulder has decided to use a reaction step. Let's see how far that gets him. So as we can see, by taking a reaction step and paying one energy, Boulder was able to move outside of the melee range of Swiggerty Swooty. If Swooty still wanted to attack him and he had the energy, he could pay one energy, take a step one inch toward Boulder, and if Boulder didn't have any more energy, or if Boulder didn't want to spend the energy, Swooty could then spend an energy to attack. 
And that concludes our Learn to Play video on Moonstone. I hope it was both educational and informative. If you have any questions on how to play the game, please leave us a comment down in the comments section below, or feel free to pop on over to the Moonstone Discord. They're also very helpful over there. I wanna thank you very much for watching. And if you're going to be at Adepticon in March, please feel free to stop by. There's going to be a Moonstone tournament on Thursday where I'm going to be uh, having, I think, about uh, eight tables worth of players. So you can get to see what uh, other people are playing and get familiar with the game. And of course, I want to thank my sponsor, Games Plus, who will also have a booth there uh, that should be well stocked with uh, Moonstone in the event that you want to pick some up while you're at the show. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So, thanks very much. Take care, everybody.